Hi, welcome back. Today I wanted to finish up our discussion on our spinning top design and look at how spinning relates to precession. And this is really cool because it's a three-dimensional object and it's, uh, there's a coupling between the spinning motion and that precession motion. And then what we see is that in our simulations that it, that actually breaks down as you start to spin slower and you start to get that wobbling or nutation. Okay, enjoy. In our spinning top experiment, we had a camera set up that was watching a top spin on top of some aluminum foil. And as that was spinning, we could actually record the vibrations and measure how the spinning rate. So the spinning produced that sound. And then from the camera footage, we can actually look at how, how many times number of precession cycles. We can look at how many times it moves around in a circle. So we'll say number of precession cycles divided by number of seconds. And this gives us our precession rate. And this is a way that we can measure and actually relate precession and how quickly this object is spinning. What I want to talk about today is how do we predict the precession rate based on how fast this object is spinning. So I want to take a second and label these axes because now we're looking at a three-dimensional rigid body problem. And this is where things get a lot more interesting. So here along this axis that's moving with our body, we have a B2, which is our main, our main spinning is happening around that B2 axis. And then down here, I'll call this my B1 axis. And then here up here is my B3 axis. So if, if this thing is fixed to go along this this vertical direction then all of the spinning would happen around B2 and this B1 and B3 would spin around in a circle. And then I have this rotating reference frame around the origin that I'll call my A2 and here this would be my A1. Let me fix that. And then here I've got my fixed coordinate system E1 and E2. So we'll, we'll describe this angle as psi that describes what angle my rotating reference frame A is moving in. So that means that up here, this is both E3 and A3. That E3 is always equal to A3. And our spinning top in the simulation has a mass of 5.81 grams. This is when density is 1250 kilogram per meter cubed, which leaves my moment of inertia 264, 290, and 264. This 290, this is that B2, along that B2 direction. And the center of mass is 10.3 millimeters. So this distance to the center of mass is L. And in order to get an analytical prediction, so be able to write down one formula for this precession rate as a function of spinning, we're going to make this assumption that the angular momentum about the, this point O, about our origin, is equal to Hg. And this happens because, so here if I have Ho defined in my inertial reference frame, where I is that E1, E2, E3, that's my inertial reference frame. This is equal to Hg, 
slash O in that inertial frame plus HG. So we're saying that HG slash O is about equal to zero. And what we have in a three-dimensional rigid body problem we have six kinetic equations and these come from Newton's second law fx equals mx double dot Fy equals my double dot, Fz equals mz double dot, and then our last three equations are that the sum of the moments are equal to, remember we need an inertial reference frame, the change in angular momentum about some origin O, or we could say center of mass, but this gives us two parts, and this is where the interesting three-dimensional parts come in. We get the body, in our body reference frame, we have DDT of HO, plus if that body reference frame is rotating, cross that HO term. And this gives us three, three equations for that sum of the moments. And we have that I alpha. So looking at these body frames, I just want to look at this A2, A3 axis. So take as if I'm taking a plane along here. I want to look at this rotating frame, grab a snapshot. So if I take that a3, which is also equal to E3, and I draw this A2 axis, then I've got my top that I'll draw in like this. And pointing up along here is my B2 axis. So this top is spinning at some rate phi dot around this axis. And what we had seen in, from our experiment is that phi dot is between 44 and 32 hertz. And we need to convert that to radians per second to talk about dynamics, but we'll get back to that. So my main spinning the fastest spinning is happening along that B2 axis. And then I've got this angle theta that's describing, so when it's nine, when theta is 90 degrees, my top is directly along this A3 axis and it's not precessing at all. So the, the smaller theta is, the more tilted this is. This is. And then along here, there's my center of mass, so this is where I actually have that mg. And I'll call it L, this little L. And the way that I've drawn this with this A2 and A3, the, the precession is that psi. So remember, psi is describing how this A2, this a axis is rotating around that E3 axis. So now we can label these. So theta is describing my nutation. 
Remember this is that wobbling that we see when it becomes unsteady. My phi describes my spinning. And this psi is going to describe my precession. So there's what we're trying to do is figure out if I'm spinning very quickly, how quickly, what is my precession rate? So based on this diagram, let's look at what is reference frame A doing? So what is my angular velocity of A? So A1, A2, A3. And this is going to be omega I so the angular velocity of reference frame A with respect to the inertial frame is equal to my precession rate times A3. And another way to say that is that it's psi dot E3. My angular velocity of B with respect to A, so this is omega B with respect to A, is equal to theta dot times A1. So this is describing this motion, this bobbing motion back and forth. Whenever what we've seen from our simulations is that when we have a whenever psi dot is large, theta dot is zero. So it shouldn't be wobbling. The faster this thing is spinning, the smaller this wobbling should be, the smaller the nutation. So omega of B with respect to my inertial frame is equal to omega b with respect to a plus omega a with respect to the reference frame. So now I have psi dot sine theta b2 plus psi dot cosine theta b3 plus theta dot a1. And so far I haven't made the assumption that this theta dot is zero. I'm just leaving it in there. So whenever that, whenever my rate of spinning is much faster than my precession and my nutation, then that theta dot goes to zero. But we'll get there. Right now we haven't made that assumption. So this is describing the kinematics of the motion here, what, what's moving. Now I can look at my kinetic. The sum of the moments about the origin is equal to the derivative in that re in the inertial frame of H O, with my angular momentum, and my sum of the moments is R of the origin with respect to center of mass crossed with the sum of the forces on that center of mass, or L times B2, so that L is my distance to the center of mass, crossed with mg times sine theta B2 plus cosine theta B3. 
I'm using a body coordinate frame. Let's go back and look at what I'm doing here. I'm trying to figure out how all of these forces and how this motion, how it's all applied within this body reference frame. I'm doing that so that I don't have a, a complicated changing, I'm not summoning the forces in a constantly changing, because here the center of mass might be moving up and down. This reference frame is rotating around in a circle. So I'm trying to get everything into B1, B2, and B3 in this part. This leaves me with negative mg L times cosine theta B1 is equal to my DDT in my body reference frame, HO, plus omega of B with respect to I crossed with HO. Now the the rate at which this angular momentum is changing is very is much smaller than this omega cross HO. So this is much larger than the change in that reference frame of HO. So we're going to ignore this term and say that negative MGL cosine theta B1 equals omega i b crossed with h o. So now let's look at what that h o is. I'm going to say that it's i y y times that phi dot. This is because phi dot is going to be much more than theta dot, so my rate of spinning is a lot more than my nutation, and phi dot is much more than psi dot. The end result is that my main angular momentum is that it's that iyy times phi dot. So the one moment of inertia that's different from the other two. Now I can plug this in for omega for that h0. And I have mgl cosine theta b1 equals omega b with respect to the reference frame, to an inertial frame times i y y phi dot b2. And if I pull over that i y y phi dot, because that's just a scalar term, I have a negative m g l cosine theta over i y y phi dot times B1. This is equal to this omega B with respect to the inertial frame crossed with B2. In order for this equation to be true, this term has to be some kind of omega, so some scalar times B3 because I need a B3 crossed with a B2 to get a B1. So it can't have, it could have a B2 component, but it would just end up canceling out. But the main thing that I care about is that it's got some scalar term times B3. So what that would tell me is that MGL cosine theta over IYY phi dot B1, so this negative equals and omega times B3 crossed with B2, which is equal to a negative omega B1. So this capital omega that I just solved for 
is equal to mgl times cosine theta over iyy times phi dot. Now I want to relate phi to my original psi dot, my precession rate. So omega i b, remember we figured out that it was equal to psi dot sine theta b2 plus psi dot cosine theta b3 plus theta dot b1. But we said that omega times b3 equals omega ib. So this means that omega equals psi dot cosine theta. And I had solved that this is mgl times cosine theta over iyy phi dot. So my final result is that my precession rate psi dot is equal to mgl over iyy times that phi dot. So this gives me an inverse relationship that the faster, if I plot precession and spinning, the faster I spin, the slower I precess. And the slower I'm spinning, the less precession I have. Okay, so now, how does this relate to our top? For our top design, we have IYY is 290.6 times 10 to the negative 9 kilogram meter squared. Our mass is 5.81 E negative 3 kilograms. L here is 10.34 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. And then phi dot, what we were trying to find is that it's 44 through 32 hertz. So psi dot is equal to 5.81 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms times 9.81 meter per second squared times 10.34 e negative 3 meters divided by 290.6 times 10 to the negative 9 kilogram meter squared times 1 over phi dot. So psi dot is 2032.2 over phi dot. Careful with units here. These are both, phi dot and psi dot are both in radians per second. If I want to get hertz, so this is a radian per second, and this is a radian per second. So it's not saying that psi dot is 2,000 times phi dot. It's psi dot is 1 over phi dot times 2,000. So if I want to get this into cycles per second, I have to take that psi dot in cycles per second equals 
2 pi times radians per cycle times 2032.2 divided by phi dot times 2 times So divided by 2 pi to get cycles per second. So you end up multiplying this term by that 4 pi squared divided by that 4 pi squared. So at phi dot equals 44 hertz my psi dot is 1.17 hertz and at phi dot equals 32 hertz I have psi dot equals 1.6 hertz So as I went from 44, I was spinning, I was precessing at about 1.2. And then by time I was rotating at 32 hertz, I was up to 1.6 hertz.